it's malpractice for, for, for me to offer surgery to a man who thinks that if you change the appearance of his nose, he will be successful in business and he'll have a wife. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and that happens. People will come to plastic surgeons with just that idea. Oh, I'm it's sure. Bot body dysmorphic disorder. I can make myself rich doing surgery on them, but I'm not doing them a good, any service. And if my peers found out about it, I'd probably lose my board certification. It's, it's malpractice. But if we do it in the case of sexual identity, mm -hmm. it's now considered righteous. Hey there, fellow tacticians. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that little notification bell because the more likes and subscriptions I get, the more people see my conservative content, which will make America a better place and angers the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. And welcome back, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us here on Tactics, where speech isn't violence, tolerance isn't love, and disagreement isn't hate. My next guest is somebody that's an expert in the field, which I, I know that everybody in the state of Alabama, and rightfully so, has been concerned about the, the new transgender law, or the one that is going to prevent minors from receiving treatment for transgenderism, whether it be puberty blockers, whether it be gender reassignment surgery. And so uh, to help us kind of understand this and sort through it, we've brought on uh, Dr. Patrick Lappert, who is a plastic surgeon. Welcome to the program, Dr. Lappert. Thanks, Caleb. Thanks for the invitation. Well, thank you so much for being with us. And uh, I, you know, usually hosts introduce their own guests, but I kind of like to let my guests give their own introduction. So uh, if you would just give us a little bit of your background and how you got into this field and, and you know, how you came about uh, choosing plastic surgery as your field of interest. Okay. Well, I've been a physician for about 40 years. Uh, I, I trained uh, my undergraduate degrees in cellular physiology, biology. Went to medical school um, uh, in the Navy, uh, served a, a, as, a, as a medical officer in the Navy for 24 years, uh, at first in aerospace medicine and then in, as a general surgeon. And then they sent me off for training as a plastic and reconstructive surgeon. Mm -hmm. I finished out my career doing uh, essentially reconstructive surgery, uh, pediatric congenital deformities, and uh, was a department head, and I was the specialty leader in reconstructive surgery for the Surgeon General of the United States Navy my last several years. I've been in private practice for about the last uh, almost 20 years, and then um, just recently retired from active surgery just a couple of months ago, but I, I still have an active practice, and, uh, and I take a keen interest in, in the issues of uh, ethics and morality in the practice of surgery. So... I've, I've written book chapters on the subject of, uh, of transgender surgery, as well as uh, journal articles on cancer reconstruction and things like that. So, Well, uh, I would say, first of all, thank you for your service. And, and I know that my audience, especially being the, <laughs> I mean, Montgomery's a military town, so we certainly right. appreciate that aspect of your career. Um, but when it comes to uh, this uh, reconstruction, I, I know that... Um, I know that, a pro that proponents of this bill, and especially those in the media, have been billing this in a certain way. Uh, and one thing that I notice that happens over and over again is when they talk about this, they say that this bill would prevent trans kids, because it is only dealing with people under 18, just for those of you who may not under be familiar 19. with it. Uh, under 19, sorry. Yeah, that's, that's sorry. correct. Um, proponents of this are saying that it's denying treatment to those people. Is is treatment a correct way to characterize this, or, or what exactly, how would you categorize that? that? Well, that's a bad categorization. It doesn't deny treatment to, to persons who suffer with transgender uh, self-identification. It just, it just limits what sorts of treatments can be offered to, ch to persons under a certain age. Uh, and really, the only thing that it prevents is uh, uh, the use of puberty-blocking drugs, cross-sex hormones, and... Uh, transgender surgery. There's all there's always been uh, uh, supportive therapy for for children who experience cr cross sex identification, mm -hmm. and it's not preventing any of that. Uh, but what it's addressing is particular forms of therapy that are hazardous and life altering to children. In much the same way that, for example, we use hormone therapy for children uh, of a different kind. Uh, you might use growth hormone uh, in certain circumstances for, for children who have some pituitary mal, uh, malfunctioning and things like that. But we, what we prevent is parents bringing their children to the endocrinologist mm -hmm. to get growth hormones because the child identifies as an Olympic athlete, right? We wouldn't, we wouldn't allow anabolic right. steroids 
in weightlifting kids who are in high school. Uh, it's the same kind of thing. There's certain things that the, that, that, the, that the government has a vested interest in protecting the health of children. And this legislation fits into that category. So it's not preventing the medical care or, the, or, or otherwise of children who experience cross-sex self-identification. It's preventing the use of certain therapy, therapies, which are, and we can talk about this, uh, sure. are not even proven safe. Uh, much less effective in, in the claims that are being made for them, for the use of puberty blocking, for the use of cross-sex hormones, and certainly for the use of, of life-altering surgery mm -hmm. on persons who don't even have the capacity to consent to such things. Well, I know that you're not a, a legal scholar, you're, you're a medical doctor, but I thought that you might have some insight into this. Are there other therapies or there other medical procedures that are denied people of certain ages, or is this the only one? Is this an outlier in that uh, that respect. Well, no, there. For example, as a plastic surgeon, uh, I would have to have a very, very compelling reason to 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 do breast augmentation on a fifteen year old girl. Okay. I mean, so essentially, essentially, the only way the only way that I could I could justify it morally and ethically would be if she had a, a, a significant congenital deformity that I was going to reconstruct. But for an otherwise healthy girl to come in and say that she just wants larger breasts and for me to do a breast augmentation on her, I'd probably lose my license for that. Uh, likewise, the example I gave you before, if, mm -hmm. a, if, a, if a dad brings his son in uh, because his dad and his son are, uh, agree that he should be a big league ball player, but he's a mm -hmm. little bit small, I, I would not be allowed to give him androgens. I would not be allowed to give him hormone therapy to, to bulk him up. This is in the same category as that. So there are already laws on the books that regulate the application of medical therapies in children. Uh, this is just a, an addition to that that uh, list of, of uh, such laws. Right. And, and the reason that I asked that specifically is because this is something that comes into the debate very, very often, especially me being kind of a libertarian minded kind of person that, uh, you know, it's, it's their body, it's their choice. So it's like, well, with minors, that's not necessarily always a good argument. That's the reason That's that we restrict things like alcohol, the reason we restrict things like uh, cigarette use, that kind of thing. And so I figured in the medical community there was something similar to that. Uh, yeah, and, and so those are, those are two excellent examples. Cosmetic surgery in, in adolescence, mm -hmm. things like breast augmentation and something like that, and, uh, and the use of, uh, of uh, anabolic steroids in adolescent kids performance enhancing drugs, things like that. You don't, you, you're not allowed to do that. Well, I'd like you to speak to this as well, because, uh, and, and there may be none, I'm, I really don't know, and I'm kind of ignorant on this, and that's why, why I came to you to ask this. Uh, what are the risks involved in a surgery like this? And you can talk about gender reassignment surgery or hormone puberty blockers, that things for regular adults, people that would not be affected by this law, and then maybe specifically for people that would be under 19. Okay. Well, at, at the beginning of, of, of the issues is the use of puberty blocking drugs. These drugs are being given by uh, gender clinics mm -hmm. to children who self-identify as the other sex. And the idea behind it is that it quote unquote buys time for them. It prevents their sexual maturation so they don't develop the secondary sex characteristics of skeletal growth, deepening voice, uh, things like that, uh, breast development in girls. Uh, mm -hmm. It prevents those things, and the idea being that the child will then have time, and it won't have such a big hurdle to overcome. Uh, you know, if they're if they're trying to feminize a masculine body or masculinize a feminine body, right? The idea behind the use of puberty blocking is that it won't be such a big deal. It'll be easier for them to transition if they decide that they want to continue on with transitioning. Here's the problem, Caleb. The use of puberty blocking drugs uh, has been part of medical care for a long, long time. But we use them to normalize hormone levels in children, uh, for example, who have precocious puberty. So there is a condition where a child will develop sexual maturation very early in life, you know, six, seven, eight years old and already developing breasts and, and body hair and secondary mm -hmm. sex characteristics. And it, ha it has massive effects on skeletal growth and things like that. Well, you have to normalize their hormone levels so that they can have a normal developmental curve in their life. And so puberty blocking drugs are given to children like that to normalize their sex hormone levels. There is absolutely no safety record even 
for the use of puberty blocking drugs in otherwise normal children. They're taking normal children and blocking their adult development, basically, uh, the idea being to, to give them a chance to make up their mind. Well, what, what happens to a child when you give them puberty blocking drugs is it stunts their growth. Mm -hmm. It completely st uh, stops musculoskeletal, well, not completely, but radically alters musculoskeletal development. Their brain development is radically altered by it. They don't develop normal psychosexual processes. Even their higher executive functioning of their brain development is altered, right? Mm -hmm. And so what happens within a year of being on puberty blocking drugs is that they physically look different from their peers. And it essentially reaffirms in their mind that there's something different about them. They'll be, you know, two, three inches shorter than their peers. They will have none of the facial maturation that, that adolescence brings. Their voice won't be changing. They won't be growing hair or anything else like that. And they'll come to believe that they really are different. So what is claimed by the gender ideal ideologues as being a pause button is really a go button because now the child is reinforced in the idea that they really are different. And what is the next step? Well, the next step is cross-sex hormone. So now what they're doing is they're taking a, a boy and giving him massive doses of female hormones in order to morph their body into something that looks female. Same likewise with a girl. They'll take a girl and give massive doses of androgen, testosterone hormone mm -hmm. to masculinize their body. And we're talking about levels of these hormones that are perhaps 10 times higher than would be normal for a child that age. And that carries with it tremendous risks of everything from blood clots in the legs, pulmonary emboli, stroke, heart attack, cancer, high blood pressure, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, that sort of thing. And, and they're doing this without, without, any, without any justification other than that the child has self-identified as the other sex. It's not based on any diagnosis. Precocious puberty, I can do a diagnostic test. I can measure the hormone levels in the seven-year-old child and go, this child has precocious puberty. In the case of transgender, there is no medical test that I can do to disprove or prove it. The child is making the diagnosis, and the doctor is now compelled to play along. Is there any... That, uh, that, that makes no moral sense to me at all. No, it doesn't make sense to me either. And that's actually one thing I was going to ask because uh, th this is being sort of billed as so much of a, an outlier. And I wanted to ask, is there any other uh, medical condition or any other space in the medical community where the patient gets to diagnose themselves and the doctor has to accept the diagnosis of the patient? No, there is no other condition. Certainly no other condition that leads on to major surgery. Where, where, where the doctor does nothing to prove or disprove the diagnosis. None. This is, this is the only one that I know of. Well, and that was actually kind of leading into another one. When it comes to the, the Hippocratic Oath, I mean, I, I've always understood that doctors take an oath that the very first thing that they have to promise is to do no harm. And would this be a violation of that considering you're dealing with a otherwise healthy body? I mean, I guess you could make the argument that there's some psychological issues going on there, but as far as the body itself... Um, like you were saying right. earlier, there's, there's nothing uh, medically wrong with the body, and so they're prescribing and treating it, and in some cases, removing body parts uh, right. of an otherwise healthy body. Is that a violation of that? Well, so it, uh, at, at first, in the prima facie look at it, mm -hmm. yeah, first, do no harm. That is, that's absolutely correct. And that's one of the reasons why we go to such great lengths to get the diagnosis right before we offer a consent form to a patient. We have, to, we have to have some level of, of uh, confidence that the risk-benefit ratio is vastly in favor of the person. There are surgeries that I do, that I've done, that are disfiguring surgeries, but, but are done to save the life of the patient. For example, I've done limb amputations on gangrenous limbs to save the life of the patient. Mm -hmm. So you can say, well, you're, you're disfiguring, you're mutilating the person. Well, I've, I've done something radical to them, but I've done it to save their life. And that's the claim that the transgender advocates will make. They'll say, well, you've got to give them this therapy. You've got to give them the hormones. You've got to give them the transition surgery, because if you don't, they're going to kill themselves. So they liken this to life-saving intervention because of the high suicide rate. And the fact is that that is not supported in the literature. The only literature that supports that idea are very small studies, very few patients, very short-term follow-ups, 
while while their patients are in the thrill of this beautiful life that they're being promised by these doctors. But if you if you actually look at patients who have transitioned, had gone through the whole process of hormones, cross sex surgery, the the whole gamut. Mm -hmm. If you follow them out beyond about five, I'm sorry, about eight years after their transition, their suicide rate is as high as it as it was if you'd never done anything for them. Nineteen times higher than the rest of the population. And in the case of female to male transitioners, it's 40 times higher. So essentially what you have at the end of this whole medical debacle is a person who still has an interior anxiety, still has an interior wound, but whose genitals you've mutilated and who you've rendered sterile, right? And put at risk for all these other problems that we talked about and have made them a dependent on the medical system for the rest of their life. And that's that's a huge disservice. Right, and that's another thing that I, I think people need to really understand as well. Um, what gender reassignment surgery does, and, and correct me if I get any of the facts wrong here, um, but what gender reassignment does in, in both cases is it creates a, a pseudo sort of a, you know, it, it, they appear to be male or female, you know, whichever one they get reassigned to. But at the end of the day, it's not the same thing because a male body still has an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, and it's still going to try to close up that wound like it's a scar for the rest of their life. And so they, they do have to continue on with uh, certain treatments that are not quite as radical as the initial surgery, but that's something that they're going to continue to have to do for the rest of their life. That's correct. Yeah, uh, what, what, what the plastic surgery uh, of reassignment, as it's called, what it produces is a counterfeit. It doesn't produce an actual male reproductive part. It produces a, a flesh phallus that may mm. or may not be capable of penetrative intercourse that will have vastly degraded sensory um, a signal that provokes erotic sensibility. Right. Right. So that that so even the erotic sensibility is vastly degraded. You've sterilized the person, so you have essentially destroyed both aspects of the human sexual union. It is unitive. It brings two persons together in a in a permanent bond, assuming that it is that it's not adulterous or some other some other evil. Right. But it, it it produces a bond of persons that is life giving, and what's what's created by these procedures is neither. It's neither. They have a vastly degraded sensory. Uh, uh, se sensation from those parts, and uh, and it's it's sterilizing. So yeah, right. Does, so there's and, and zero said, chance of reproduction said, and very little chance of the other happening. Correct. When, when we were talking about the literature earlier and about it on the mass scale, I think that people, the average person, doesn't really understand the difference in case study and larger swaths of data. Sure. Because you're right, it, th there are some studies that are out there where right. the, the case data actually looks very promising, where the person seems to be cured of right. their gender dysphoria and they're sort of in uh, trans joy, I think is the, the actual term for it. Uh, but yeah. then if you look at the metadata, you see that the suicide rates post-transition are actually almost identical to suicide rates pre-transition. That's so, correct, yeah. So on the larger scale, it, it seems to do nothing. No, that's correct. So part of the part, whenever you're examining medical literature, there's certain things that you want to look for, particularly when you're talking about uh, outcomes data, as it's called. Mm -hmm. Are we doing the patient good? Or are we not doing the patient good? And there's certain biases that you can find in in journal articles that are relatively easy to spot. So, for example, there's a thing called self-selection bias. Self-selection bias is where the patient determines whether they're going to be in the study. Or, or, or the patient is going to return for follow-up. Just consider the bias that you will get if all of the bad outcomes never come back for follow-up. Well, if only the good outcomes come back for follow-up, you're going to think you're doing them a world of good. Right. Well, the bad outcome in transgenderism is suicide. Dead people don't come back for follow-up. And right. so if your study isn't able to track those patients down, it's going to skew your data in the favor of a good outcome. That's just that's the, the crudest example. The best mm -hmm. data, though, has got to be the long-term data. And the best database at, at present is in the Netherlands, but really in Sweden is the best uh, database because they have, a, they have a medical database that involves everybody in Sweden from before they're born 
until their room temperature. They're entered in the same database using the same language, and, and, and you're able to go in there and compare apples with apples. Mm -hmm. So if, for example, I wanted to see what is the likelihood that a, that a 27-year-old person is going to commit suicide, and I can compare transgender persons with a 27-year-old male, middle of the birth order, middle class, urban dwelling, whatever I want to look at. I can compare apples to apples, and, I, and now I can make a statement. I can say, well, the relative risk for suicide comparing that study group of transgender persons with the rest of the population is. That's the database mm -hmm. that has shown us that there is a period, there's sort of a grace period after transitioning that lasts about five to seven years. And when you get out to year eight, all of a sudden, the, the self-harm rate comes right back to what it was before, right? The excitement, as you, as you pointed out, the excitement is gone. People are not encouraging you any longer because they're essentially through with you. You transition. You've been called a hero now for nine, ten years, and they're they're tired of bringing it up. And there you are. You're left with this interior wound that is what caused the problem in the first place. Body dysmorphic disorder is what we used to call this. Body identity disorder. Body dysmorphic disorder. It's where a person ascribes to the appearance of their body the explanation for why they have this tremendous interior anxiety, right? Oftentimes associated with feelings of, of uh, uh, loss of safety. And, and uh, the classic example is the anorexic girl. An anorexic girl is convinced that the reason why she doesn't have any friends is because she's fat. Mm -hmm. But she's not actually fat. She has, a, she has a compulsive, an obsessive thought that she's fat. And she has a compulsive behavior about that fatness, but you can't talk her out of the fact that she's that she's not fat at all, and and so so they have a misperception about their appearance, and they ascribe all of their sorrows to the appearance of their body. It's a very common presentation in the plastic surgeon's office. I have to tell you, people come to plastic surgeons all the time trying to be happy, and the reason they think they're not happy is something about their appearance. And we as plastic surgeons are trained to recognize those patients because it's malpractice to offer them surgery. It's malpractice for, for, for me to offer surgery to a man who thinks that if you change the appearance of his nose, he will be successful in business and he'll have a wife. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and that happens. People will come to plastic surgeons with just that idea. Oh, I'm it's sure. Bot body dysmorphic disorder. I can make myself rich doing surgery on them. But I'm not doing them a good, any service. And if my peers found out about it, I'd probably lose my board certification. It's, it's malpractice. But if we do it in the case of sexual identity, mm -hmm. it's now considered righteous. Well, so here's my question on that. If that's the case, then what happens to somebody that goes through either puberty blockers, hormone blockers, and, and then maybe even transitions and goes through the actual reassignment surgery? Uh, what happens to them, and, and maybe is this the reason that the suicide rate gets really high on down the road, um, let's say that they decide that they were wrong in doing that, and they actually are a man and actually are a woman, but now they've completely disfigured themselves, does that cause some kind of body dysphoria? Oh, it sure can. It, the transgender regret is a whole new category of human suffering now. And, uh, and there are, there are uh, ever-growing support groups for people who regret their, their, their transition. Uh, there's a particularly great um, uh, resource called um, uh, sexchangeregret.org. Sexchangeregret.org. It's run by a friend of mine named Walter Heyer, who went through that whole transition. He suffered greatly as a child, was, uh, was convinced by his, his friends and his peers that he's transgender, he was a very successful in, in the automotive industry, had a wife and kids, went through the whole transition, lived eight years as a woman and realized he'd made a horrible mistake. And now he's been living as a man again for 30 years. And he helps people who are going through this, this regret. And, and virtually all of what we're doing to these children is irreversible. The, the claim is made that puberty blockade is reversible. There's no proof of that at all. There's, and this certainly is not a, a re utterly reversible when you use cross-sex hormones. If a girl uses testosterone for a year, she will always have a deep voice and she will always have facial hair and she will always be more heavily muscled than if she would have been. And, and, and facial skeletal growth will be very masculinized. You can't take that back. And certainly if she has a mastectomy, 
you can't you can give her back breast mounds, but she'll never be able to breastfeed. Likewise, and, and, and likewise, the, the long term use of estrogen in, in males it renders them sterile, right? And, mm. and, 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 and feminizes their bodies. They'll need surgery to get rid of the breast tissue that they grow. And, and the odds are very high that even if they didn't have bottom surgery, that they're probably sterile. So, yeah, it's, and, and so this is what this legislation is about it's about protecting children from irreversible changes. And, and decisions that are being made for them by people who think they're doing them good. And, and, and remember that the diagnosis is being made by that pre-adolescent child. They're taking children who are in second and third grade and encouraging them to believe that they're the other sex and funneling them right into gender clinics. We've got school counselors and school nurses and teachers who are encouraging children to think this way. Our classrooms are being filled with this, with this deranged literature of gender ideology. It's seeping into the military, it's seeping into the libraries, it's seeping into public schools, even private schools. And children are being overwhelmed by these sexualizing messages and they're being asked to make decisions. Like, do you wanna go on puberty blockers? Oh yes, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely, I'm a girl and I wanna go that route. And they'll be encouraged. They're being called heroic. If, I, if an anxious child is getting nothing but encouraging messages, they're going to feel really good. Well, it's it's lucky for us that teenagers and people that are in the puberty stage of their life are both not gullible and are known for only making good decisions. We're, we're real lucky <laughs> that that's the case. I mean, honestly, that's, right? the, that's the thing that has baffled me throughout this entire debate about it being about children. I was like, but we don't even trust teenagers to make decisions like getting a tattoo and, right. and yet we say that legally they should be able to have life-altering surgery that would permanently sterilize them and change right. their appearance in the way that you're describing. Now, you know, like I said, I, I tend to be very libertarian on a lot of these things. If, if you're over the age of majority, I, I may not agree with your decision. I may tell you that your decision is stupid, but that's your decision to make. But when we're talking about minors specifically... I mean, I don't. I know that this is a big secret that most people don't know about, but teenagers tend to not make great decisions. You think? <laughs> I hitchhiked from from San Francisco to Portland when I was fifteen. I'm here to tell you, teenagers make really bad right. decisions. Probably not the smartest decision. <laughs> not the smartest thing I ever <laughs> but, did. <laughs> but but that's the thing that astounds me about this is I I totally understand the mantra of the government shouldn't be protecting you from your own bad decisions. But at the same time, when we're talking about minors, th that that's a completely Correct. different scenario Correct. there, and and that's Correct. especially true in the medical community. Yeah, and and you add on to that. I mean, I don't want to be a utilitarian about this, but you you're basically you're taking children and making them lifelong dependent on the medical system. That the same people who advocate for for gender transitioning, gender ideo ideology, are the same people who are militating for government-run healthcare. So essentially, what you're what you're taking is you're putting this added burden on the taxpayer for lifetime care of persons who are going to be dependent on the medical system forever. Right. I mean, let's you know, I don't mean to take this uh, way too political, but let's remember that Barack Obama was the person that was accusing surgeons of removing people's feet like diabetics feet, uh, just even though that wasn't necessary just to make a quick buck. And those same people that were saying that, you know, doctors and, and physicians and surgeons are evil money grubbers that will just do needless procedures for no reason are also saying, but we should totally trust that when they are engaging children in this in a uh, basically a, a surgery that will make them dependent upon them for life when they otherwise wouldn't be, that we should totally trust that that's legitimate and they have no profit incentive uh, for doing so. So can I ask you a question, Caleb? Fire away. Would you characterize your audience as being predominantly Christian? Uh, pretty much, yeah. I'm, I'm sure that I have some non-Christians, but sure, the yeah. overall oh, no, majority clearly. are, for sure. Clearly. Yeah, well... Here we are, we're, we're, we're in, the, in the Easter season. Mm -hmm. Here, uh, here's something I want to leave you and your audience with. Sure. That there's something about this transgenderism that's, that's more than just what you see on the surface. There's something literally diabolical about it. Because think about this. A child looking at themselves undressed in, in a mirror mm -hmm. and, and believing and rehearsing in their mind the language that, that they are a person who's in the wrong body as if there is such a thing, as if the human person is some 
some disincarnate spirit being that may or may not occupy the right body. That is contrary to Western thought. It's contrary to Christian understanding of who the human person is. And if you believe that it's possible for a person to be in the wrong body, then essentially you have completely removed any understanding of what it what the incarnation of Jesus Christ means. Because if a child can look at themselves in the mirror and say, that's not really me, then they can, they, they can meditate on Christ on the cross and say, that wasn't really God. God was occupying a body, but God did not really die on the cross because the God-man didn't really exist. This is a direct attack on the Christian understanding of who God is and what God has done for us. Well, and it also rejects God as the creator because ultimately Correct. what you're saying is that, and I've, I've said this for a long time, I didn't intend to go this direction with you, but since you did, I'm, I'm go. going to bring it up. Um, <laughs> uh, when it comes to that, essentially what you're saying is I am my own God. I get to decide what gender I am. That's not God's call. That's my decision. And so it is a form of self-idolatry in a way yes, it is. Uh, that you get to make yourself into whatever that you want. But I will say that the irony and the, the logical inconsistency there that I've always found quite amusing is that for somebody that is a uh, someone that only believes in the physical realm, that does not at all believe that there is anything to the spiritual, they'll say that you were born in the wrong body. Well, if all you are is a body, that's not possible. Like the only way Bingo. they can kind of justify it is say, yeah, well, but no. your soul is in the wrong gendered body. Yeah. Now, of course, that's not true because God doesn't make mistakes. But right. the only way that you can believe that is if you believe in the spiritual and something outside of the Correct. physical realm and outside of science. That intelligence can exist apart from the material world. Right. Yes, exactly. You hit it out of the park, brother. That's exactly right. So it's a self-contradictory thing. That if you if you believe in the if, in the material causation of the human person, that we are a string of material accidents that led to what is called man, and yet you can consider that a human person can exist apart from the material that you see, then you just contradicted yourself. Completely. Right. That makes absolutely no sense. You yeah, you've no. completely destroyed your own worldview at that point. Exactly. Now, I could maybe exactly. understand somebody. I mean, it's wrong, but it is logically consistent to say. <laughs> That there is a spiritual realm, and there are things that are supernatural, but uh, whatever God or Parthenon of gods that created us sometimes make mistakes in putting people in the wrong body. Now, that's ridiculous, but it is at the very least logically consistent. The idea that someone who is an atheist or believes only in the material can also believe that you can be born in the wrong body, that just makes no sense at all. Yeah, and, and you know what really makes even less sense is that after 40 years of being a doctor— I never, I never read a single textbook, never read a single journal article or heard a single lecture where the human person was described as a spirit being that occupies the body. And yet you've got these doctors who, who claim expertise in endocrinology or pediatrics that actually use that language. You go to the websites of these gender clinics at the biggest hospitals in America, and they'll have verbiage like that that's saying, we gave them cross-sex hormones so that he could align his body with the person he always knew he was on the inside. What does that even mean? What does that even mean? You know, well, and yet, I, again, and, 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 and they'll have the doctor's name, MD, endocrinology, board certified. Like, who are you and where did you get these words? Well, and that's another thing, too. I, I find that funny because saying who they are on the inside also would imply some kind of spiritual, because unless you're talking about like the lungs and the heart and the liver, well, every cell of each of those organs either has an XX chromosome or an XY chromosome. So, again, it, it, it doesn't make any sense. Um, but ultimately, uh, that that's the thing that, you know, atheists have been preaching for years is that. Um, science doesn't deal with the spiritual, which they're correct in saying that, but then they want to have their cake and eat it too when it comes to certain issues that they, they try to use it to justify their political agenda. That's correct. That's All right, correct. so uh, thank you so much for being with us. I think this has been uh, very enlightening, and I appreciate you uh, taking some time out of your day to do this. Uh, now, I know that you know the show airs a lot of our audiences in the Montgomery area, but we do broadcast all over the state of Alabama, and I'm sure that we have some viewers. In fact, I know of a few of them up in the Decatur area. Um, if there are any people watching this that would like to get in touch with you or um, you know might you know need your 
professional expertise as a as a doctor and a plastic surgeon, how would they get in touch with you? Uh, you can find me online at LaffertPlasticSurgery.com. All right. Well, yeah, uh, and I always end all of my uh, interviews like this. Is there anything that you want the audience to know that maybe I wouldn't have thought to ask? Uh, what I want the audience to know is that is that it is possible to trust common sense. And there's nothing about this whole transgender argument that even passes the initial sniff test. It's a complete fabrication. The whole thing is a complete fabrication. And, and, and the, the ones who will suffer the most are the children mm. and, and family life will suffer if, if we do not stop this juggernaut of insanity called transgender medicine. I trust your common sense, brothers and sisters, because you are given it for a reason. You know, it's been written in your heart who, who you are as a human being. And, uh, and, and this is no, no exceptional case. Transgender is not an exceptional case. It's, it's part of the human experience and, uh, and it has to make sense in order to be true. So, so trust your common sense on this. Well, one. I appreciate that because uh, you don't have to have a medical degree to understand that not. this makes sense. That's one of the things they do all the time is they bully us with their with their credentials and the diplomas and then just and they keep changing the language and they say, well, you don't understand. Obviously, you don't know what I meant by this word or whatever. You're not an expert. Trust me. I'm an expert. No, no. It's like yeah. those uh, old Dr. Pepper commercials. Trust me. I'm a doctor. You know, that's, <laughs> yeah. Drinking a Dr. Pepper does not make you a doctor. Let's move on. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, all Dr. Right. Lappert. I appreciate it. You have a good all one. Right, Kevin. Hey, if you liked this video, then you should press the like button. I mean, that's literally what it's there for. If you liked the video but didn't hit the like button, then it's like getting great service but not tipping your waiter. Except liking is free, and so is subscribing and hitting the notification bell. So if you're enjoying my content but not liking my video, there's really only one explanation. It's because I'm black, isn't it?